Halifax became a proving ground for some of the theories that were going to be used in designing that atomic bomb for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, when you look at those newsreel photos, there is a very eerie similarity between what Japan experienced and what we experienced. Only one generation had passed when, in 1939, conflict again engulfed the world. As in every war, it was the fighting men who pulled the triggers, fired the shells, released the bombs. But as this war advanced, whole armies of scientists were recruited too. Their orders were to conquer the new realm of nuclear physics. German scientists realised the military potential of nuclear energy, triggering a race with the Allies to build the first atom bomb. As the fortunes of war swayed back and forth, the key battleground was in top-secret laboratories. What now sounds like elementary physics was a formula which could win the war. When a particle called a neutron strikes an atom of uranium, two more neutrons are released. Vast energy is produced and then multiplied. In a time span almost too short to measure, there's a chain reaction. The proving ground for this theory, promising unlimited explosive power, would be here in New Mexico. In 1943, the world's most brilliant physicists were gathered in the utmost secrecy at a place called Los Alamos. They understood the science of the atom bomb, but what would it do to the enemy? We were looking to use these in combat situations, and it was thus necessary to know what this energy release would do to targets. The scientists staged experiments with large quantities of conventional explosives. This is what 100 tonnes of TNT looks like piled up at the New Mexico test site. It's less than 5% of the explosives which went off in the Halifax disaster. But when it blew up, the fireball was visible for 60 miles. The chief scientist at Los Alamos was J. Robert Oppenheimer. He and his team had also been studying existing data in the file marked Disasters. Oppenheimer and others actually conducted a mini history lesson to see what an atomic bomb might look like. And the first very large detonation was of course the 1917 Halifax explosion. Why was this one so devastating? The scientists noticed something called the Mach stem effect. The Mach stem effect is basically the reflected shock wave coming off the ground and merging with the shock wave in the air for an enhanced, powerful blast wave. Because a ship is above the Earth's surface, an explosion shock wave shoots down as well as up. It's reflected and magnified. Scientists saw that this could make an atom bomb more devastating too. That ultimately led to the decision to have the bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Both those bombs were air blasts, i.e. above the ground, as opposed to a ground blast. And they therefore did more damage and caused more loss of life than if they'd been a ground blast. As scientists neared the day when they would test their theory, there was shocking confirmation of their predictions. Almost as if fate had ordered another experiment on a huge and tragic scale. Look down from California's Mount Diablo, Devil Mountain, and you'll see an extraordinary piece of history. Lying just off the US Navy base known as Port Chicago, what they call the Mothball Navy. Warships, many from World War II, rusting at anchor. In the war, the ships had plenty to do. Port Chicago handled huge quantities of explosives, brought in by rail, 
then loaded on supply ships destined for the war in the Pacific. On July 17, 1944, one of these supply ships, the E.A. Bryan, took its turn at the dockside. Loading the explosives was a punishing business. The dock workers, all of them black enlisted men, were under extreme pressure to make a rapid turnaround. That night, the EA Bryan was receiving cluster bombs, depth charges, and incendiary bombs. And it's interesting to note that the incendiary bombs were what we would call hot, that is, they were fused, uh, ready to go into action, could be tripped at any moment. With 4,000 tons already aboard, 500 more on the dockside, and the men rushing to finish, something cataclysmic happened. It was massive. That pillar of cloud rose over two miles above the earth. The state capital, Sacramento, about 70 miles north, felt it. People in Nevada, two to 300 miles away on the other side of a massive mountain range, felt the concussive seismic force of it. In a few seconds, Port Chicago had become a wasteland. Dockside buildings had been turned to matchwood. The ship had vanished. All but these two chunks of the keel and hundreds of smaller pieces scattered over five square miles. 320 sailors were killed. Body parts were found in various places. In fact, along one wire fence, skin of a human's face with the eyes, nose, and mouth holes clearly discernible was, was located and, of course, had to be removed. What caused the blast is still unknown. An accident in handling the live munitions was judged most likely, but scientists were less interested in the cause of the explosion than the effects. Port Chicago was of interest to the scientists at Los Alamos because it proved to be a model for what an atomic bomb might look like. The Los Alamos Director of Weapons, US Navy Captain William Parsons, was ordered to make careful measurements of the destruction and then present a report on what he'd learned. What they were able to calculate at Port Chicago very effectively was the effect of terrain and other impediments that get in the way of a blast wave. There were actually survivors of this blast very close in who normally you would think would have been killed uh, who were shielded uh, by structures and managed to survive. The column of fire rose... The data confirmed that if the point of explosion had been higher above the ground, the shock wave would have been more widespread. The second thing was how far away from the burst you had to keep the air crew so that they could survive. An aircraft flying overhead that night at 9,000 feet reports chunks of metal the sizes of small homes or garages flying past. The problem of how to escape alive was of special interest to Captain Parsons. He had been selected as one of the flight crew who had dropped the world's first atom bomb. That day came on August the 6th, 1945. And the lessons learned from both Halifax and Port Chicago would be put into effect. The bomb was dropped from 30,000 feet, giving the crew time to escape. It had been set to detonate 2,000 feet above the ground to maximize its destructive power. In the explosion itself, and from the after effects, 140,000 people died. After a second bomb was exploded over the city of Nagasaki three days later, Japan finally surrendered. Now the world knew the awesome power of America's atom bomb. But before long, even this would be overshadowed by the ultimate explosion of all time.
The order of magnitude is almost incomprehensible, but one way you can look at it is that the bomb dropped by the Soviets was on the order of 6,000 Hiroshima's, all in one shot. It was on this frozen desert island, in the most dangerous period of the Cold War, that the ultimate explosion took place. Novaya Zemla in the Arctic Barents Sea is where the Russians demonstrated their nuclear might, testing bombs of ever-increasing power. October the 30th, 1961, they pushed the limits of explosive power further than they'd ever gone, or will probably ever go again. This bomb was codenamed the Tsar. It contained the equivalent of 58 million tons of TNT, or all the explosives used in World War II multiplied by 10. The science of bomb making had changed radically since the first atomic test in New Mexico in 1945. Five, four, three, two, one. Early atom bombs like this worked through what's called nuclear fission. Hydrogen bombs use a still more powerful process known as fusion. Inside an H-bomb, an initial atomic explosion is used to force together isotopes of hydrogen. The pressure is so great that the atoms fuse, releasing enormous energy. With an atom bomb, there is a practical upper limit where you can only put in so much fuel before it would just self-destruct from pre-detonation. There's no theoretical upper limit on how big a hydrogen bomb can be. Although beaten to build the first atom bomb, Russia caught up, then overtook America in building ever bigger hydrogen bombs. The Tsar, the biggest bomb, the most powerful device mankind has ever constructed, was to be their masterpiece. And a political showpiece too. Six camera crews were assigned to film this unique moment in history. The air crew were hand-picked, They'd been warned their safety couldn't be guaranteed. They could avoid being blinded by the light, but being knocked out of the sky was quite possible. The exact moment of release was controlled from the ground. The bomb had been given a parachute to slow its descent and give the crew more time to escape. They did escape, but only just. The plume rose right through the cloud layer and kept on rising. It flattened out when the cloud was 40 miles high. The blast wave was still large enough to be measured on its third passage round the world. Because the bomb was detonated two miles above the ground, there was very little radioactive fallout. But the earth directly below the burst was seared by the intense heat. Rock had been turned to ash. The bomb was four times bigger than anything America has ever exploded. Why something so large? The United States could develop very accurate missiles. The Soviets never mastered that technique very well. And to compensate for that, they really could level a very large area and take out their intended target without having to actually hit the target itself. Aimed at a target the size of London, here's what would happen. The blast wave would obliterate everything in a circle 30 miles wide. The fireball would be 110 miles across, incinerating everything in its path. A similar device aimed at Washington would cause equally widespread blast, fire and radiation effects. The likely death toll in the tens of millions.
But why did the quest for ever bigger bombs suddenly cease? As the destructive power increased, political leaders worried more and more that they were really playing with fire. In 1963, the superpowers banned bomb tests in the atmosphere, underwater, and in outer space. I think that the Soviet detonation will probably be the biggest ever man-made detonation in the future as well. And so the soldiers and scientists have packed up and flown away. This island's days as a bomb site are history. <laughs> <laughs>